are at the end, wrapping up this long year's worth of time together in the book of Romans. Uh, I've really enjoyed, as a staff, we, we actually started Romans in the summertime, and, and Nathaniel, somewhere, oh, there you are, you blend in more than I do. Uh, Nathaniel actually led the staff in a study of Romans, so we stayed uh, a few weeks ahead all school year, and we were able to really dig in a lot, so it's been a lot of fun going through Romans. Um, there's a lot that we didn't cover, uh, a lot of things in Romans that we weren't able to even mention. Uh, if you've been reading along at all, or Nathaniel's group's been studying, my group's been talking about Romans a little bit, um, but go back and, and read this book uh, and dig into it, uh, find a commentary. I think we've all mentioned different commentaries we've been using this year uh, that we've been in Romans to kind of get some more valuable information on there. Uh, I want to encourage you guys to take advantage of the summer. Like I said, we've been in, Romans is kind of deep, uh, but take advantage of the summer. Whatever you're doing for the summer, your pace is going to be a little bit different. Um, I thought it'd be cool if, if when CCF gets back together in August, what if we had all read the whole Bible over the summer? And so I actually looked up in version that we have a version app, and it should still be able to pick up even though we're not at the Havener Center where I set it up for. Um, they have a 90-day Bible reading thing. So there's a challenge for you guys. Sign up for it. Read the Bible this summer. And then we get back together. Like this fall, CCF resumes, and we could throw a big party, maybe roast some pigs, get some T-shirts that match. I don't know, something crazy like that. Uh, maybe two pigs. We'll see. Um, anywho, we're going to jump right into our passage tonight. So we're in Romans chapter 14. We're going to go through 15, 13. Uh, and so we're not going to actually read the end of the book. Um, that's what Amy did to me with Harry Potter, and so I hate the ending of books now. And so you'll have to read it for yourself. Um, but no, just kidding. The, the ending, we'll talk a little bit about it. She did ruin Harry Potter for me, though. Romans 14, 13 through chapter 15, 13. And I'm, I have my Bible in my hands because it's like my, my little blankie of comfort, but it's actually on my page, so I don't have this memorized if it looks like I do. Uh, I'm actually reading. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. But what you eat do not destroy, but by what you eat do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the, spirit, of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to com confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in love. That's a long passage. <clears throat> I have kind of three things to pull out of this passage, and then I have a, a pre-conclusion and then a conclusion. The, the first thing that he talks about there was we're not supposed to pass judgment. And you've all heard people say that, like, don't judge me. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever said that to someone? You don't know me. 
And, and this is tricky because he says it pretty plainly that we shouldn't judge, but, but what do we do when, when our friend is, is struggling with life? You know, you have that friend that is stuck in, insert whatever sinful thing he or she is doing here, and, and we, we want to talk to them about it, but we don't want to judge them. How do we handle that? Paul here is talking about not, what he's talking about here, not judging is food. And that was a problem the New Testament church had as they came out of Judaism, as they became the church. You go back to Acts as the church like takes off, Jesus rises up and they're standing there and the angel's like, don't hang out here, go do something. Peter speaks in tongues and all that happens. The church begins and they start traveling and Paul goes all over the world and then writes this letter to Rome as he's traveling. They struggled with food because Jews had certain food rituals, and they had a whole thing in Acts that talks about that they wanted the new Christians to first become converts to Judaism, then they could become a Christian, and that was a big burden on some people that they're right off the bat. I mean, if you think about the qualifications to be a Jew, no thanks. I'll pass. And so they, they kind of talked together as a church on that and said, hey, let's, let's not make this burden too heavy on them, but food was still a struggle because they were raised, this was their long-term thing. Food was also a struggle for the, the non-Jews, non-Christians, because all these other religions had these, these foods they sacrificed, these methods, these things they ate, the way they ate them. So everyone was, was worried and concerned about food, like, oh, am I, if I eat this food, am I, am I honoring this Molech or this, this other god, or am I doing this thing? for Because I don't want to be like that, but, or I want to I wanna fellowship with these believers, they're new believers, but, but they're, they're having... They're some dinner they're calling Pumbaa, and I don't want to, because that's not what I grew up with as a Jew, and so I can't, but is it clean? Is it unclean? Certain foods were, were just inherently unclean to the Jews, and certain foods were made unclean by rituals dedicated to those false gods and other religions. Paul says we shouldn't put a stumbling block. We should pursue peace, joy, and mutual edification. You know, there's, there's certain foods that we all, some of us eat and some of us don't eat. I can think of one particular food that if you come in my house, this is what we're going to have. And if I go in your house, I'm judging you. So, you know, we're, my house, we have Jif. All right, anybody on the Jif side of the bandwagon? The rest of you, we need to stop now and have some prayers <laughs> because you're wrong. Uh, but anyone, Peter Pan, what do the rest of you eat? <laughs> Skippy's not even on the chart. Man. But, I mean, that, that's a silly example, okay? I actually, I haven't eaten, well, I had peanut butter once in the past three years, and that was an accident. Um, but it, it's a silly example, but there are others. You know, how many people are, I don't know if this is embarrassing, but anyone a vegetarian? Hey, nothing wrong with it. I actually was a vegetarian for four months, and I hated it. <laughs> that's, again, another thing that was Amy's fault. I don't No, It's probably good that she's not here tonight. Hopefully she hasn't parked around the block because these are loud. Um, should we eat pork or not? That, that's a huge debate that I've had. I mean, a lot of people here are really excited, and I said Pumbaa, and people are like, what? And those guys, everyone's like drooling at you now because that's where the pigs <laughs> sit. So it's not your rugged good looks. Maybe it is, Alan. Uh, what, what are some other big problems we have? Coffee? Coffee's not a problem. Coffee is a passion. How about alcohol? Some people get really upset about alcohol, and some people don't. It's a big debate. How do we deal with a friend who, who, who wants to do something that we don't feel like we should do, but maybe we don't think it's wrong, but maybe it's wrong for that person? How do we, how do we find that, that place of love, that place where we can not have a stumbling block, where we can't tell them that, well, this is, this is all bad when the Bible doesn't say that. We deal with those situations in love. Certain choices are good for you and not good for me. Certain choices are good for me and not, not good for you guys. Uh, I can handle and I enjoy eating red meat. Anyone in that boat? All right. Am I okay to keep talking about my wife? Has anyone seen her like creeping on the corners? So Amy is a red meat eater, okay? Like she wasn't feeling well the other day, and so I, I came to work a half hour late and uh, ran to Price Chopper and bought her a ribeye steak and grilled it for her at 8 in the morning. And she felt better. I mean, who wouldn't feel better having a ribeye steak for breakfast, right? Um, but, but some people don't want to eat red meat for conscience reasons, some people for health reasons. And so that's, that's a thing. So if someone's coming to my house that's a vegetarian, there were a couple of hands raised, if I think about that, I'm probably not going to serve meat at that meal. We'll have a nice salad, which... Funny story, actually, there's a meme that's just a bowl of bacon. 
that's my favorite kind of salad. Um, some people can handle physically eating a nice slice of bread. Other people would have some major struggles if they were to eat that same slice of bread. Some things are good for you, but not for me. Some things are okay for me, but not for you. So how do we find that gap? How do we, how do we meet that? Uh, some people think that having a glass of wine is one of the most atrocious sins you can commit. Other people have no problem with it. We err on the side of love. We try to build each other up. We lean towards love, not judgment. There are times, and 1 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about this, and I didn't actually put this scripture in my pages, so i got to find it real quick. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about times that we should judge. Um, if you're a Christian and you're a professing believer, then heck yeah, I absolutely need to be judging you. Maybe, maybe judge is too strong of a word. Maybe I should use the phrase, hold you accountable. If you're not a Christian, then, then I might have a slightly different standard for you. But if you're, if you're proclaiming Christ like I am, then, then you have the standard, and the standard is right here. And so I'm going to judge you. I'm going to hold you to those standards. If you're breaking the law of God, if you're sinning before God, then, then I need to judge you. And we run into problems there whenever someone judges me, someone holds me accountable, and I get caught. That's, that's my ego coming in, and I'm, I'm really upset about that because who are you to call me out? And then we, we get upset, and we turn around, and we're like, but what about you, and you do this thing? And that's against what the Bible says. Instead of joining together in love and, and unity, like Nathaniel talked about last week, unity, do things to build up the body of believers. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to your eternal salvation and to sin and comes to God, I will absolutely judge you and hold you accountable, and I expect the same from you guys for me. Don't get caught up in things that don't really matter. And that goes back into verses 17 and 19 of chapter 14. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And verse 19, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. We can argue, we can get mad at each other because you don't want to eat the bowl of bacon I set before you, but it doesn't matter. We should build up one another. We should edify the body. We should encourage one another so that we can go out unified before our community before wherever we go, and be ready to proclaim God as king. The second big thing I wanted to talk about comes out of the first verse of chapter 15, and it says that we have an obligation. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. And that here, we who are strong. How many of you are strong in the spirit? <laughs> Hands are like, I don't know if I should say yes. I, this is interchangeable at times. There are times when, when I feel super strong, like, in the spirit, and I'm, like, I'm rocking life right now, like, laughing at Satan, get back, you can't touch me, and then I say that out loud, and I'm like, oh, crap, here it comes. <laughs> and then I have to flip and go to someone else who is just having, like, a really hard time, and, and we, have, we flip that around a lot. But when we're strong, we need to pay attention to the people around us. We need to pay attention to our relationships, to our friends, to our brothers, to our sisters, to the people in the pews or chairs next to us, the people sitting in the grass across from us, and work to help one another. When we're strong, we build up. And this, this very much calls for action. Okay, you can't, you can't uh, fulfill that obligation by doing nothing. Okay, if um, I, Cole's standing right there, and so I think of riding a bike because he does that. Cole wants to like ride 20 miles today. He can't do that sitting on a couch. That'd be super cool. If that was the case, I write a lot. <laughs> it requires action. It, it doesn't mean to that obligation um, to bear with the failings. It, it doesn't mean just to put up with. It doesn't mean just to have patience with. It's a call to help out, to share the load, to take some of that off. It's like a relay race instead of a marathon. It's a lot easier to do the relay unless it's like everyone's doing the same distance and then that's just ridiculous. But we, we have that call to action here that Paul gives us that's throughout the scriptures as well, that we have that obligation to our weaker brother on those days that he or she is weaker, and make sure you don't get cocky because that could flip really quick. Get your back into it. Put the weight under your shoulders and help out. The, the third thing is, is an application. Uh, in, in this verse here, and I didn't write down the verse, and I'm not going to try to look forward, it says, for even Christ... Okay, and that's our, that's our example right there that Paul gives. He's, he's wrapping up everything, all these things he talked about throughout Romans, all the things you've heard us talk about throughout this year, and, and it comes down to this, like your role model on what you do and how you do it 
is to serve, and that role model is Christ. That example is Jesus, and this, again, requires action. You can't serve Christ and love your neighbors and be a part of their lives if you're just going to sit inside, if you're going to look at your feet as you walk to and from class. You can't take care of your neighbors. You can't be like Jesus if you don't go out and do something, if you don't go out and share the gospel, if you don't go out and develop those relationships, if you don't go out and take the things you hear in, in sermons, the things you hear in small groups, the things you hear at church, and do something with it. You've got to have that call to action. Don't judge them. Bring them into the, into the family. Bring them into Christ. Introduce him to them. Hold them accountable. Fulfill your obligation to help them, and they'll help you and serve them, just like Christ did. Toward the end of our section, and this is the pre-conclusion, Um, he says, as it is written, and he refers to four verses, and I thought this was really neat when I saw this, that these verses kind of have a progression. The first one is, he refers to Psalms 1849, therefore I will give thanks to you among the nations, O Lord, and I will sing praises to your name. So this is God's name being declared to the Gentiles, okay? So there, go out and tell them. And then Deuteronomy 3243 is the next one Paul quotes, And he says, Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance on his adversaries and will atone for his land and his people. And this is the Gentiles joining in and praising God. And then Psalms 117.1 is the next verse, and it says, Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. And this is the Gentiles independently worshiping God. So someone told them about Jesus. Someone brought them in to worship with them. And then they sent them out to worship on their own and continue that. The final verse here that he quotes, that Paul quotes, is from Isaiah eleven ten. The focus is put on Jesus in this verse. It is then in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. The focus of all of that, telling them, worshiping with them, sending them out to worship, the focus of all that is Jesus, who is our hope. This hope that we have, this isn't a hope that, maybe Jesus will save us. This isn't a hope that if I'm good enough, I can get there. This hope is the hope that we have in sharing the gospel because Jesus did, dot, dot, dot. Jesus did share the gospel. Jesus is the gospel. Jesus did die for you. We accept that and it's done. We don't have to worry about if we're good enough because we're not. That hope is because Jesus did. We finish up and wrap up everything we've been doing with hope. Paul ends this section, which is followed. I said we'd talk about it. I have like eight words, or don't count them because I didn't. Followed by a few greetings and a give them our love type of sentiments. How many was it? All right. I figured someone would. Um, but he wraps up all of that other than those, those last closing sentiments with a blessing. These people that he, he had been traveling, he spent the first part of his life you know, very much learning education about God. The next little chapter of his life was a dark one where he was, he was chasing after and persecuting the Christians, and then he flipped that around, and he was the one being persecuted. He was going around doing this work for the rest of his life to proclaim Christ as king and share that hope relentlessly, and that's what we're called to do. We have this hope, not a hope that maybe we can, but a hope that Jesus did and that's what we leave from here and we take on wherever we go from here. If, if you're graduating and there's a handful of you here that are graduating, you're going to go somewhere and, and do grown-up stuff for, for a while. Share Jesus in that, in that place. Some of you are coming back here. Uh, come back here after the summer. Share Jesus. Some of you are going out for the summer to, to have a job. Share Jesus. Some of you are going back to your families, and your families need to know about Jesus. Paul closes this section. And, and after this, the worship team will come back up, and we'll, we'll stand and we'll worship together. And as we worship, we'll pray that it doesn't rain. He says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. All that Paul talked about in this letter to the Romans, the letter to Corinth, Galatia, all these letters he did, he instructed them, and all that he got on to them about, all that he commended them for, it all comes down to this hope. Go out and share that gospel. Don't judge them, but hold them accountable. Fulfill your obligation to help them carry that burden. When they're weaker, help them. And finally, serve them in whatever way. Serve God in everything that you do with all that you are. 
And that's, that's the culmination of everything we've been doing. All that Paul's been teaching is that hope. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for having this place we can come together and read your word and talk about your word and talk about the hope that you have given us, God. I pray that you would help us wherever we go, that we could always remember that and we could act on that hope, God, that we wouldn't, we wouldn't sit idly by, God, that we would get up and we would fulfill that call to action. I pray that you would give us strength and you would give us energy and you would give us wisdom to know when to say and what to say and how to go about encouraging those people around us, God. Thank you so much for this passage. Thank you for this book. And thank you for those who are here to worship with us tonight, God. And I pray that you would hear our voices, God, as we sing to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray.